Murder and Mayhem, The Newlywed Murders, The Bonnikers, 1884. It was bitter cold with occasional snow on Wednesday, January 23, 1884, as Lewis Hildebrand rode his horse north on Gravoy Road, leading from Rock Township toward Fenton, where he had business for the day. As he passed through the little community of Murphy, he saw the smoke rising from the chimney of Mary Horan, the proprietress of the general store and post office. A few hundred yards away, on the opposite side of the road, he could see the little two-room log cabin where newlyweds, Louis Boniker and his bride, the former Josephine Glatt, resided. No smoke was rising from their chimney, and it appeared the door to the cabin was open. Surely not. It was freezing. Nevertheless, Lewis had pressing business to do and decided to continue his journey. On his return trip, heading southward down the road, he once again noticed the house looking empty. Moving closer, he saw that the door was indeed wide open, and something was crumpled on the ground in front of it. Becoming alarmed, he dismounted from the horse and hurried over to investigate. What he saw caused him to stop dead in his tracks. There was a young woman, hacked, bloodied, and frozen to the icy ground. That wasn't the end of the horror. Cautiously, he entered the house and found a young man, his head almost completely decapitated from his body, sprawled on the blood-soaked bed. Welcome to another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson, bringing you stories of murder and true crime with a twist of genealogy. This month's true crime story revisits the newlywed murders Lewis and Josephine Boniker, 1884, from a podcast I hosted as head of genealogy at Jefferson County Library in Missouri. Located about 25 miles south of St. Louis, Jefferson County is nestled in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. The Mississippi River marks its eastern boundary, and the land is rocky with rolling hills. Pioneer life in this rugged area required a special kind of individual to survive. The story of the murders of Lewis and Josephine Boniker is perhaps one of the most tragic because of their youth and the terrible way in which they were killed. Rock Township, once called Little Rock, is located at the northeastern section of the county just below the St. Louis County line. Among its pioneer population were the Czech and Slavic immigrants who settled along Rock Creek and German stock who tended to migrate toward Maxville, now called Arnold, and surrounding communities. Residents of these small communities tended to congregate in circles that included others with their common cultural heritage and background. Marriages between neighbors, church members, and school chums helped preserve the tight-knit bonds of community. Such was the case between the families of Henry and Catherine Boniker and Conrad and Catherine Glott. By 1880, two of Glott's sons— Philip and Jacob had married Boniker's daughters, Caroline and Lizetta. It can be surmised that these families were part of the Protestant congregation of St. John's Evangelical Church of Christ, which was established in 1838, located near what is now the city of Arnold. The original building was a small frame structure with a bell tower steeple and situated on a rock foundation. Several members of both families are buried in the adjoining cemetery. It appeared that another coupling between the Glott Boniker children was on the horizon as a budding romance began to take shape between Josephine Glatt and Lois Boniker. However, circumstances in their lives around 1880 seemed to curtail that prospect. 
Josephine was a pretty girl with full lips and almond-shaped eyes. Her heart-shaped face was framed with long, light brown hair. She had no shortage of suitors interested in winning her hand, particularly when about 1880 she went to work as a domestic servant for Mr. and Mrs. Henry Burmeister of 1304 Hickory Street in St. Louis. Her position required her to live in the city with her employers, and that gave her a certain amount of freedom she had not enjoyed at home. Despite the attentions of other gentlemen, Lewis never gave up his hope of winning her affection and continued to call on her whenever he made trips into the city. His perseverance paid off. In November 1883, Josephine became gravely ill and informed Mrs. Burmeister that she was going to go home to recuperate, but that she had decided to accept Lewis's proposal of marriage. No date had been set for the wedding, but she promised to give notice if she decided not to return. This news delighted Mrs. Burmeister, who was fond of her hard-working maidservant. She later confided to a reporter that there was another gentleman who was a regular suitor, Max Eckert. He was a plumber who had met Josephine while doing work for the family, and afterwards regularly treated Josephine to special outings to exciting places like the theater and balls. She thought that perhaps his offerings would be more tempting to the young girl than those of her childhood sweetheart. As it turned out, Josephine did not return to her duties at the house on Hickory. She and Lewis married December 3, 1883, and began their lives together in a small rented log cabin on Murphy in Gravoy Road, between High Ridge and Fenton. The cabin was simple, with only two rooms divided by a thin partition wall. The front room was used as the newlyweds' bedroom, and the back room was used as a kitchen and dining area. Lewis planned to plant a small crop in the spring and begin a long, happy life with his beautiful young bride. Perhaps it was the excitement of setting up house that opened the way for the tragedy that occurred a mere six weeks into their wedded bliss. The truth is that no one really knows for certain what happened that night, only that it was the most mysterious and sensational murder to happen in Jefferson County history. Monday afternoon, January 21st, 1884, Josephine's brother Philip stopped by the cabin for a brief visit. He left shortly after and all was well with the couple. On Tuesday, January 22nd, Mary Horan, a widow who ran a general store and post office across the road from the log cabin, noticed her cows had gotten out and were in the neighbor's yard. She instructed her daughter, Mary Ellen, to go get them and bring them back home. She noticed that no smoke was rising from the chimney of the cabin and assumed the couple had gone for the day to visit family. On Wednesday, Lewis Hildebrand mounted his horse and started down the road toward Fenton. He lived a few miles east of the Boniker cabin and passed it on his way. Noticing that no smoke was rising from the chimney, but the front door appeared to be open, it gave him pause but he decided to continue on his way to take care of his business in Fenton, about four miles further up the road. It took a few hours to get his business completed, and by early afternoon he headed home. When he passed the little house again, he saw the door was still open and no sign of anyone at home. This time he decided to dismount and at least shut the door as the temperatures were freezing. As he made his way to the house, he saw something crumpled on the ground blocking the door from shutting. To his utter horror, he realized it was the butchered, bloody body of a young woman. His heart pounding, he entered the cabin to investigate further and saw the bed situated just to the right of the doorway. The body of a young man was wrapped tightly in a blood-soaked blanket, and his head had been almost completely severed from his body. Mr. Hildebrand did not go further into the house. He quickly remounted his horse and galloped back into town to call for help. 
When authorities arrived and examined the scene of the crime, they found evidence to piece together a grisly theory about what had occurred there. The murders had occurred on Monday evening, January 21st. Someone, most definitely a man, had stopped at the house and lodged there for the night. A pallet of blankets was laid out on the floor of the back room near the stove. The man had laid on the pallet until he was certain that the young couple was asleep. He had possibly taken his pants and coat off and was sleeping in his white shirt. He quietly picked up an axe he had noticed propped up in the corner of a room when the shapely Mrs. Boniker was preparing his sleeping arrangements. Perhaps it was the sound coming through the thin partition of the young lovers in the adjoining room or possibly they had offered refreshment before retiring for the night and he had become intoxicated. Whatever the reason, he had determined to rape the bride and aimed to kill her husband to prevent him from stopping him in his mission. In the still dark of the night, he brought the axe blade down savagely on the young man with a blow that almost separated his head from his body. Lewis had not moved from his cocoon of blankets and surely, mercifully, was never aware of what happened. Josephine, however, did wake at the terrifying, shadowy figure of the man lunging at her. He ripped away the bodice of the chemise she was wearing and began attacking her. In her horror, she fought valiantly and managed to escape out the door wearing only her torn chemise and a short sleeping skirt into the frosty night, desperately trying to reach Mrs. Horrens to beg for help. Angered by his lost prey and knowing he could not let her live, the stranger grabbed the axe and ran after her. He managed to swing the blade, but it missed her head and hit her shoulder blade, glancing off and swinging back to cut his leg. He began wildly thrashing the blade as she fought him off, receiving several defensive cuts on her arms. She was able to get her footing again and turned to run, but this time he brought the axe down twice, hitting her squarely in the back and side of her head. She fell to the ground, and the blood gushing fell dead. He must have stood over her a moment, trying to determine whether anyone had heard the commotion. Satisfied that no one had been disturbed, he took her by the hair and began dragging her back to the cabin, leaving behind a pool of blood where she fell and drag marks with streaks of blood on the road and leading to the door. Once inside, he dropped her in a heap at the door and checked to see that Lewis had not moved. He was dead. He went back into the back room where he had seen a trunk and an old-fashioned wardrobe and used the axe to pry them open, leaving behind traces of blood and long strands of Josephine's hair stuck to the furniture bloody handprints were left where he had opened the items and rummaged through looking for valuables, finding a pocket watch and a gold chain. He realized he was covered in blood and unable to go back out in his own shirt. He took a shirt and gray jacket belonging to Lewis. Not bothering to clean the axe, he discarded it in the cabin and left. Josephine's feet blocked the door, so he simply walked away, leaving the door ajar. Had it not been for that, the discovery of their bodies may have taken more than the two days they laid there. Deciding it was too risky to take the main road, he went through the yard and down a ravine where footprints of his trail faded. When the authorities finished examining the bodies and evidence, they sent for Squire Cornelius Dillon of Merrimack Township to call an inquest jury. When they tried to lift Josephine's bludgeoned body from the floor, the mud from being dragged and the congealed blood in her tangled hair had frozen to the floor, and it took some prying to get her up and cleaned off for the medical examination. Dr. E.J. Thurman of Fenton examined the bodies, 
finding that Lewis had a bruise on his chest that looked as if it had been caused by the blunt side of the axe. He had been cut with a powerful blow on the neck, which was the cause of death. Josephine had at least ten separate and distinct cut wounds on her arms, shoulder, and head. She also had bruises on her breast. She was only twenty years old, but she had fought viciously for her life. As word spread about the murders, neighbors, friends, family, and other onlookers began arriving. Their bodies had been covered with sheets, but Josephine's brother Philip, perhaps out of anger over the savagery of what had been done to his sister and brother-in-law, was reported to raise the sheets for the curious to see. Talk began to swirl about who could have done such a thing. Reporters arrived seeking to capitalize on the sensational news. Josephine's mother, Catherine Glatt, admitted that her daughter had given birth to a baby about four years earlier, when she was about 16 years old, but the child had lived only a day and a half. The child's father was Gustav Neitschwitz, the son of a tinsmith. This shocking revelation started up the theory that they had been killed by a jealous ex-lover of Josephine's. After the interview with Miss Burmeister revealed the relationship between Josephine and Max Eckert, suspicion fell on him, and his name appeared in the newspaper as a likely culprit. It didn't take long for the young man to appear at the police station to prove his innocence. He admitted that he had been a frequent caller to Miss Glatt when she resided with the Burmeister family, but that a few months ago she had informed him that she had accepted a proposal of marriage from her childhood friend, and they had parted ways amicably. He had not seen her since that time. On the night in question, he had been at the opera house with friends who would vouch for his whereabouts. As it seemed unlikely that Lewis would have allowed a former beau of his wife to spend the night at their home, that theory was abandoned. Another more plausible theory came to light that there had been a traveler, perhaps a peddler, in the vicinity of Fenton the night of the murders. This man was described as a young man about five foot eight inches tall, wearing a dark suit a stiff round hat, his pants rolled up and carrying a small hand satchel. He stopped in Fenton at Waymire's saloon to warm up that afternoon, inquiring about a place to stay the night. He left there and went on to Kaiser's where he did have a drink or two, and again asked about a place to stay. Several patrons suggested he go down the road to Mrs. Horan's. She was a widow who kept a general store but might accommodate a traveler. He left there as it was growing dark and stopped at several houses along the way asking for lodging. It was not uncommon at that time for people to take in weary travelers. However, none of the places he stopped were willing to allow him to stay and each time suggested he go on to Mrs. Horan's. He never made it to her house. Perhaps he had already determined to rob or murder a victim, and a general store seemed too much of a risk that someone would be able to identify him. There is no way to know, but Mrs. Horan and her daughter, who was near to Josephine's age, may have barely escaped a similar fate, if he had taken that advice. The theory of the traveler gained credibility when the satchel, which had been described by so many witnesses, was found hidden in the hollow of a tree in a thicket near the Boniker's home. Inside it, they found jewelry, pencils, tablecloths, and other items common for a peddler to have. What happened next defies logic. As the sensational story was published in the newspaper, it was picked up across the nation. Suddenly, there were reports of men from various places confessing to the murders. 
One man, Henry Sachs, had lived in Rock Township and had lost his wife about two years before. He turned himself in to the police, claiming that he had been in love with Josephine, and it had driven him mad to learn she had married Lewis. He told an elaborate story describing details about the house and murder, but his story didn't match up with the facts of the case. Soon, his son came to pick him up and explained that his father had been drinking heavily and was suffering from delusions. Then, there was a statewide and nationwide roundup of peddlers who had any semblance of matching the details about the suspect, but each one was let go with either a strong alibi or lack of evidence to tie them to the case. Perhaps the most shocking and most puzzling incident came with the attempted suicide of a man by the name of Michael T. Layton. M. T. Layton was born in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, but moved to Iowa in the late 1870s. He married Mary Spracklin, and they rented a small farm in Modell, Harrison County. They had two children, and she was pregnant with a third, when in January 1884, he received word that his father, Hugh Layton, had fallen from a horse and was seriously injured. Layton was 29 years old that year. He was about average height, medium build, with light hair. According to those who knew him from Modell, he traveled to St. Louis on Wednesday, January 23rd to board the Panhandle Fast Track to Pennsylvania, which left on the 25th. According to Reverend C.A. Dickey, who sat in front of Layton on the train, the young man kept praying and mumbling strange things. He seemed to be very distressed and begging forgiveness and then crying out that he was innocent. Then he'd say things such as, It was a horrible death, and I couldn't help it, and their eyes are on me, and other disturbing things like that. At one point, he got up and tore his ticket to pieces, then went to another passenger and accused him of taking his ticket, and he wanted it back. This went on for the entire trip, and the reverend became alarmed when the man grew more agitated as they got closer to Pennsylvania. As they passed through Steubenville, Ohio, Reverend Dickey called a train porter over and explained the situation. He feared the man would leap out of the train as they crossed the Ohio River, so they locked the doors. Suddenly, as they crossed over the bridge, he heard a sound and turned to check on the raving man. To his utter disbelief, he had shot himself in the right breast. He was removed to the baggage car to await arrival at the station, at which time he was taken to West Penn Hospital. Doctors believed the man was suffering from insanity because he kept wailing and begging them to cut his head off with an axe. He kept confessing to a robbery and continued to describe a grisly murder. Someone recalled having seen something in the newspaper about a murder in Missouri that had occurred earlier in the week. As it was put together that Layton had been in St. Louis at the time, it was thought that he may have been responsible for the killings or had read about them and in his agitated state had imagined he was responsible. It was believed he could not survive the gunshot, but as the days passed, he showed signs of recovery. Word went out all over the country in newspapers about the strange incident and the police interest in interviewing him if he lived. His parents were anxious to get him out of the hospital, probably for fear of a lynch mob. Neighbors and family in Modell were mystified about what had happened. They described him as a good neighbor, a bit odd, a heavy drinker, and quarrelsome when drunk but they could not imagine that he could be responsible for anything as sinister as the Boniker murders. As other newspaper reporters claimed others had been arrested, the interest in Layton as a suspect apparently waned. There must have been solid proof that he had not left Iowa until Wednesday the 23rd. 
and the murders had occurred on Monday the 21st. What caused him to act in such a way will probably never be known. No further mention was made about him in the newspapers. He did recover and went back to Modell where he and Mary had as many as eight children and he lived to be in his 60s. Sadly, no one ever answered for the crimes that occurred that night. Two young lovers met a gruesome death just as they were entering the happiest season of their lives. Louis obviously loved Josephine. He had to have known about her illegitimate child. In that time, something like that would have set her apart as tainted forever by most men, particularly those who came from such strict moral backgrounds. But Lewis continued to seek after her. They were buried side by side in the Boniker family plot the Friday following their deaths. A large group of family and friends gathered to lay them to rest. Many years later, as a final insult, the area became a hangout for wayward teens. The graves were desecrated and the bones scattered. Even in death, they could not find rest. Josephine's skull was stolen or carried off by wild animals. Caretakers of the property reburied the remains, but the damage had been done. Over their graves is a stone written in German. When translated, it reads, Here rest in God those who were handed over to death by the hands of a murderer. Thank you for listening to this month's tale, The Newlywed Murders. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. See the description box for more information about the resources used. Join me again on the first of next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.